This jacket spent over a year in my closet. It languished on an overhead shelf, kept in a bag with the tags still on. You might find this jacket a bit overdramatic, over the top, garish even. I accept that, that's okay. A shin length silver sequin duster coat is not for everyone, but it is definitely for me. I loved it the moment I saw it. It is the exact sort of thing I always dreamt of wearing as a kid. I said, oh, when I'm in my 30s and I can wear whatever I want. I was imagining this. Yet I kept it in my closet for over a year. I purchased this jacket for my wedding. I envisioned myself wearing it at the reception, dancing and sparkling and filled with joy. But the jacket was packed away when COVID hit and we decided to postpone the larger celebration of the wedding that we had spent months and months planning. This was by all accounts, a very minor loss compared to the massive loss of life and livelihood and employment that has been caused by the pandemic, but it was a loss all the same. So I shoved away the jacket and a good portion of joy along with it. I thought about taking it out on a number of occasions, Christmas, my birthday, even thought about wearing it the day I was able to get my first dose of the vaccine. But nothing felt special enough, joyful enough. I decided to wait until the time was right, until the pandemic fully ended, until I felt a bit more sparkly myself. I ended up waiting until my wedding reception after all, which was every bit as wonderful as I imagined. But I have to tell you, I'm not sure that I made the right decision. Because essentially what I did was wait to celebrate. I was waiting for some perfect moment or external cue to wear something that just makes me happy. We've all done this to some extent. We save the restaurant coupon for an anniversary. We downplay an achievement because we hope a bigger one is coming soon. We don't make the phone call because we just aren't quite in the mood. We often save our joy for big moments. Birthdays, graduations, weddings. Yet in our scripture, Paul tells us to rejoice now. In fact, he says to rejoice always. I read an essay a few weeks ago on how to make any day your best day. I initially clicked it with some annoyance. Okay, okay, what, what influencer is gonna tell me how to make every day my best day by waking up at 5 a.m. and meditating for an hour? But it was, it was more insightful than I thought. The author, Lindsay Krauss, reflected that since the, ban the, since the pandemic, she's become increasingly nostalgic. She found herself believing that all of her best days were behind her and that any future good days would just have to wait until after all of this was over. It left her feeling like her life, the life she was living now, was on hold, wasn't worth much. So she decided to do something about that and declare random days her best day. 
And in doing so, she discovered that a rather mundane Tuesday was transformed into something special. She let herself stay up a little later to talk with a friend. She lingered in the sun before going into work. She savored her run in the park. She began to notice the joyful moments that she might otherwise gloss over. It's a rather profound shift and one that has some cognitive science behind it. Our brains are constantly sorting information, right? Deciding what to pay attention to, what to remember, what to sift out. We're more likely to remember emotional moments, including the moments that we have anticipated and that we've labeled as special. So if we consciously tell ourselves that a day is the best day, we are more likely to notice and remember joy. This is not a fail safe. We can't exactly hack our brains and get rid of anything negative. And even if we could, it wouldn't be healthy. And that would lead us to have a life completely untethered from the reality of human experience. We can, however, choose how we orient ourselves to what is happening. We can choose to be on the lookout for joy. And we can choose when to celebrate. Perhaps Paul means something similar when he writes, I will say it again, rejoice. Let your gentleness be known to everyone. Do not worry about anything, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. Paul's words can be a wonderful encouragement. And depending on how you're feeling today, they can also be a little annoying. Rejoice today. How can I rejoice when there is a new COVID variant? How can I rejoice when there is gun violence in our community? How can I possibly rejoice after the week I had? I am exhausted. Paul's call to rejoice might just fly in the face of our feelings. So some of us might be tempted to say, Paul, mm, Paul, if only you knew what I'm dealing with here. That might even echo the feelings of Paul's original audience, the church in Philippians. The Philippians were struggling. They were struggling with these external pressures and internal divisions. In fact, these conflicts had become so severe that Paul was really worried that the Philippian church would split. Rejoice today, Paul, if only you knew what we're up against. But Paul does know, or he can at least sympathize, because Paul wrote this letter from prison. Paul wrote this text about joy and peace and a lack of anxiety during one of the most difficult moments of his life. How? How can that be? How can it be that Paul rejoiced in the midst of persecution? Well, to understand that, we need to understand the source of Paul's joy. Paul doesn't just say rejoice. Paul says rejoice in the Lord. Rejoice because the Lord is near. God is the source of Paul's joy. Therefore, Paul isn't waiting to celebrate. He isn't waiting for better circumstances. 
He isn't waiting until he is out of prison. He isn't waiting until he's feeling less anxious. Paul rejoices now because God is now. It is as simple and profound as that. It reminds me of the alternative lyrics to this little light of mine. We're going to sing it later. <laughs> the ones that go, this joy that I have. The world didn't give it to me. Do you know it? This joy that I have, the world didn't give it to me. This joy that I have, the world didn't give it to me. The world didn't give it and the world can't take it away. Rejoice. That's what it's saying. Rejoice. Now, because God is now. Rejoice because that joy, it doesn't come from the world. It doesn't even come from a sparkly coat. It comes from God. That's the entire purpose behind this Sunday of Advent. The Sunday of joy. That is its entire purpose. Traditionally, Advent was a time of fasting in preparation for Christmas Day. Can you imagine all those holiday parties, all those cheesy movies, all those Christmas cookies we've been eating. We've been eating those, right? It's not just me. None of that. Advent, like Lent, was a disciplined time of prayer and repentance and contemplation. And some Christians still celebrate Advent this way. But the Sunday of joy, ooh, that was something entirely different. The Sunday of joy is a break in the discipline. It is a Sunday to break the fast, to eat a rich meal, wear a joyful color and celebrate. It is a reminder that joy breaks in and is present now. Yes, now, right now, even now. Joy can be present in the midst of difficulty. Just look closer at Paul's theology. Paul writes, do not worry about anything, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, make your request known to God. I actually read this as an acknowledgement of anxiety because I have to believe that Paul had worries. I do. I imagine that he worried about his ministry because I don't know a pastor who doesn't. I have to imagine that he worried about his churches, those that were going through difficulty. I have to imagine that he worried about his situation. So when Paul says, do not worry about anything, I take that to mean, don't let that worry consume you. Don't think that that's all there is. Share it with God. Share the stress with God. Share the concern with God. Let God hold it with you. Let other people hold it with you. Paul did. Paul actually received supplies and visitors and prayers from the Philippians when he was in prison. Paul reminds us that we are not alone and that that is cause to rejoice. And Paul says, make your requests be known to God. Don't miss that. We can request things from God. Have you ever asked anything of God? Raise your hand. Have you ever requested anything of God? And if you haven't, try it. Scripture says we can make our requests known to God. Do you know how amazing that is? That we can say, God, I need help. God, be with me. Make your requests known to God, and that is cause to rejoice. And Paul also differentiates between joy and an individualist pursuit of happiness or indulgence. Sometimes we pursue things as a source of joy. We think that's what we're doing, but we're actually trying to insulate ourselves. We're trying to insulate ourselves from discomfort, to surround ourselves with things 
surround ourselves with wealth or perceived safety or status, but that is not joy. In fact, the gospel defines joy as liberation, including the liberation that comes from relinquishing stuff that you do not need. Paul says, let your gentleness be made known to everyone. Gentleness meaning generosity. Rejoice and let go of that stuff that you do not have a need for. Rejoice and let go of some of that privilege you are hoarding. Rejoice and bring other people along with you. Rejoice and add another seat at your banquet. Rejoice and release the debt. Rejoice and let the prisoners free. Joy, that kind of joy, it's a source of strength. Indeed, one of the other lectionary texts for today comes from the prophet Isaiah, who writes, surely God is my salvation. I will trust and will not be afraid. For the Lord is my strength and my might. They have become my salvation. With joy, you will draw water from the wells of salvation. With joy, you will draw water from the well of salvation. Oh, my friends, we are nourished by a flow, a deep well of love and grace that never ends. And we can rejoice because we are connected to that well and we can keep going back to that well. We can sit by that well of living water. So church, my question is, what are you waiting for? What are you waiting for? What do you think needs to happen before you can celebrate? And consider that what you are waiting for might not happen or it might not come anytime soon. The stress might not go away next week. The sadness or the grief might not melt overnight. In my experience, it usually doesn't. We certainly are not returning to the way things were before the pandemic. So let's rejoice now. Let's sing now. Let's dance now. Tell people that you love them right now. You might not get a perfect day to do that, so do it now. Have friends over for dinner now. Wear a silver sequin coat now. There might not be a perfect day to do it, but that doesn't mean you cannot wear it. Do the things now that bring joy because God is here right now. Rejoice. Always, beloved, rejoice because Emmanuel is coming. Amen.